Good afternoon, everyone. Today we're going to evolve some viruses. We've been talking in this course for a long time about evolution. Everything we've dealt with is the product of evolutionary forces on viral populations. So today we're going to explore how this works. We're going to cover a lot of ground, a lot of different concepts, but in the end you should really have an appreciation for how this works. Questions we're going to deal with today, where did viruses come from? Where are they going? How are they getting there and how would we know? I'm going to try and touch on each one of these. Now, as we have talked about a lot in this course, what viruses, viruses can have huge effects on populations and vice versa. So host populations are needed, of course, to support viruses and the viruses need to change probably on an hourly basis to the changing host conditions. So host popu viral populations are highly influenced by the host and they can change very rapidly as witnessed by the new influenza virus evolving in China. It also works the other way. Viruses can affect host populations. They can wipe out entire host populations uh, unless the host is able to counter and adapt to the virus itself. So it's a two-way street. It's not just the virus evolving. It's both of us. We tend to see the virus evolving because it happens much, much faster. You know, think humans take forever to evolve. Thousands and thousands of years to see any significant propagation of a gene. So it's a lot easier to see with viruses. And in fact, much of the, m many of our concepts of evolution have come from studying uh, viral systems. Now, most, much of the public doesn't believe in evolution but it's right in front of our faces in the form of viruses. Every time a new virus emerges, whether it's drug-resistant HIV, influenza every year, or brand new viral diseases, which we'll talk about next time, that we've never seen before, this is evolution happening. So I don't understand how you can't believe it when you see these things doing this. Of course, you can't see viruses in me. Maybe that's part of the problem. And perhaps the speed that they're evolving at is so great that no one understands that because evolution in other animals, such as ourselves, is so, excuse me, is so slow. <clears throat> so the definition for today's lecture, viral evolution, is the change of a population in the face of selection. As I've said, uh, if the virus population doesn't change, it will disappear. It has to adapt continuously. And viruses are very successful because they have huge numbers and huge diversity because of mutation and recombination. And this is really unprecedented in all other things on this planet, maybe, except even bacteria. There's much more mutation and diversity in, in viruses than in bacteria. So an important thing to keep in mind is that we're not talking about a single virion or a single particle. When we talk about evolution, we're talking about the entire population. All right, because as you will see, that's what a virus is. It's a huge collection of mutants, and they're made in huge quantities. So don't think of an individual particle as an average. We used to do this, and I'll show you an example of that in a bit. We are population biologists, even if we don't want to be them. Huge numbers, huge amounts of mutation. We'll, we'll talk about this today. I don't know if you know Stephen Jay Gould, but he paraphrased Marshall McLuhan, who said a long time ago, the medium is the message. He was referring to television. You know, he said just having that TV in the room there is the message itself. Well, Stephen Jay Gould, the geneticist, said the median is not the message. The average of a population is not what's important. Um, every individual is a potential winner, and as you'll see, sometimes in a huge population of viruses, it's one particle that makes it through some kind of selection, some sort of bottleneck. So forget about averages. It's not the median. It's, sometimes it's the individual particle. You'll see what that means in, by the end of this lecture. So we're going to consider four, the four main drivers of virus evolution. What make viruses change and adapt to new hosts and new conditions, whether it be sunlight on a given day or uh, a new host it encounters and so forth. These are the four. They make a lot of progeny, more than anything else on the earth, and they make a lot of mutants. And as you know, I've told you several times, the RNA viruses are, are kings at this. 
quasi-species effects. Now that's something new. I mean, this is something discovered in viruses, and we'll talk about what that is. And finally, selection, which are the pressures that act upon the progeny in huge numbers and the mutants in the quasi-species to give you evolution uh, in the end. So here's an example. We have really touched upon this before. Here's an example of how viruses make so many progeny in a short period of time. These are two infections with hepatitis B virus or HIV. And we're looking at viruses in plasma or in the infected cell. We're looking at the half-life, the daily turnover, and the total production in blood. This is remarkable for over 10 to the 11th particles uh, per day, per day in HIV infected person. Sorry, uh, in an HBV infected person, slightly less for HIV. Huge turnovers. So these viruses are reproducing at great rates. And of course, that is where selection acts upon these, these big populations. Uh, in the infected cell, uh, a bit less. But here is the key, uh, huge amounts of virus that can be act acted on by the forces of selection, which is we're what we're going to talk about. <laughs> So viruses make also large numbers of mutants. Not only do they replicate really well and make large numbers of particles, but they make large numbers of mutants. And this is absolutely essential for evolution in any organism. You can't evolve unless you have mutations. And these are produced during copying. And as you'll see, these are actually the error-prone nature of polymerases is actually selected for. If you get rid of it, that's a bad thing for evolution. Now, the RNA viruses are the masters of error-prone replication. I just had to work on a virus that was called the master. That's why I work on an RNA virus. They have an average error frequency of 1 in 10,000 or 100,000 nucleotides. So whenever their polymerase is making a copy of a template, it makes 10,000 bases or 100,000. It's making about one error in that time. So in a 10 kilobase virus genome, if it were one in 10,000, that would be one mutation per genome. So every time it's copied, the genome has one mutation. And there are thousands and thousands, tens or hundreds of thousands of replication cycles per cell. I should say RNA synthesis cycles per cell. So you can see there's a lot of variation in just one cell. But in the organism, it's huge. And I can't emphasize how, how, how huge that is. DNA viruses have a different lifestyle, and that's why Dr. Silverstein works on the DNA virus. They're much more conservative and easygoing. You shouldn't be reading the paper. You have to defend yourself. Yeah, and it's true. Uh, they have a narrow host range. Persistent infections are very common. They don't change very much. Uh, and of course, that's because at least one reason is their genome replication is not as error prone as RNA viruses. They are DNA viruses. They use DNA dependent DNA polymerases, which of course have error checking mechanisms as we talked about last time. So they generate significantly less diversity. They, they evolve more slowly. They, it's not to say they are without evolving. They have to, of course, to, and they have been very successful. The, the herpes viruses uh, have been around at least as long as the dinosaurs. So they have been longer. And we know dinosaurs who work on them as well. So uh, <laughs> they obviously can mutate. Uh, but they just do so slower than RNA viruses. But if we had a battle between an RNA virus and a DNA virus, we know, we know who would win that one. <laughs> now let's talk about quasi-species. This is a, not a name which came into the literature uh, in 19, what is this? Where's the year? In the 70s, 1978. Let's see, what was I? I, was a, I think I was a graduate student and I saw this paper. I had no clue what it meant and it took me about 10 years to figure it out. It was a paper on analysis of an RNA bacteriophage population. So this group had studied the variation of an RNA bacteriophage as it infected E. coli. And they used a technique which had not been known before. We didn't have sequencing at this point, but you could get a look at the sequence heterogeneity by a technique called fingerprinting. And what they said here was this phage population is in a dynamic equilibrium with viral mutants arising at a high rate and being strongly selected against on the other. The genome of Q-beta cannot be described as a defined unique structure, but rather as a weighted average of a large number of different individual sequences. 
So that is what he called the quasi-species, and it has stuck since, and it's becoming clear that this is the crux of virus evolution. And as I said, it was, it was really ahead of its time, it was ahead of my time and many other virologists as well. So quasi-species means, uh, that's what we call a virus population, it exists as a dynamic distribution of non-identical but related replicons. So every member of an RNA virus population is really different and that's why we call it a quasi-species. So this is a diagrammatic representation of a viral quasi-species. So we have a tube of virus, and in this tube are millions and millions of virus particles. But if we could sample the sequences, this would be a, a small subset. And each of these lines is a viral genome, and the symbols are mutations in each viral genome. This just shows you how they differ. And pretty much every viral genome on this uh, diagram is different. That's what it means to have a quasi-species. They picked this up in that study of Q-beta. They picked up the fact that almost, well, they couldn't tell if every genome was different, but they could tell that a significant fraction was different. And so they supposed that there must be huge heterogeneity. Now, if you sequence this virus population, if you take this RNA and sequence it by a variety of methods, you get a sequence down here, you get a line. You get an average of all of the genomes in this population. And this is misleading because there is no, or there are very few viruses in this population that look like this. Here I see I have one here, but sometimes there are none that match the consensus. So when you hear about consensus sequencing, that is a method of sequencing which is not sensitive enough to look at individual molecules in your virus population. It can only look at the average, okay? And for many years, we all did consensus sequencing. We would come up with a viral sequence, but it had nothing to do with actually what was in that tube. All right, so that's the quasi-species. Now, there are many, many implications of this, all right? The first is that when you take a virus culture, and this is, this also applies to DNA viruses, but more amplified for RNA viruses. You take a tube of virus, you infect a cell, you're not infecting with one genotype. You're infecting with a huge collection of different ones, okay? So you're not initiating by a single virion, but a population. That population is the product of what happened in the cell in order to select it. And then when those, when that population infects a new cell, selection is reimposed, so you change the population from cell to cell. So this is always happening in nature, and we are beginning to realize that if you change the landscape of this population so that the proteins are all the same, for example, but the RNA sequences are different, that can have a big effects on the ability of the virus to evolve. Now in the laboratory, we do something that is not right, and that is we work with small populations and as a consequence, they don't have the variation that is needed to make them fit. And you'll see an example of that in a moment. So you get extreme fluctuations, and so some of the results we get in laboratories are incorrect because of this. What is really more uh, likely is that what happens in nature represents what viruses are capable of, but we have anomalies in the laboratory. Now an example, when I was a postdoc, I, I figured out the sequence of poliovirus which is shown here in the back, and you need to memorize it. Yeah, just kidding, of course. You, can you read it even? Probably not. I once gave a talk and someone in the back said, I can't read the first line. <laughs> so this is 7,440 bases long, and I may have told you this already. It took me one year of my life to do this, right? Whereas now it would take a, a less than a day, but such was the technology. And I had this sequence, I said, this is the sequence of polio. How wrong I was. This is, this is the average for that tube that I happen to have, okay? That is the myth of consensus sequences because I didn't know if this meant anything with respect to say, polio replicating in a person somewhere else in the world. They may have had a totally different quasi-species uh, which was ir irrelevant, yet I took this sequence and I inserted it into cells and I made virus and I studied that virus for years and years. And who knows what differences I would have seen if I had started with a different consensus produced somewhere else. So the, the reason it's a myth, because it's unlikely that a genome with this consensus is actually replicating in the population. At every base of this sequence, there is diversity, okay? Now, nowadays, we can do deep sequencing. We can start to get at the individual 
virus in a population. We're not quite there yet, but someday we will be able to say what is the total sequence variation in a tube of virus, and then we'll be able to actually make a distribution. We won't have a sequence anymore, but we'll have a distribution. Uh, how many of each base is there at each position, for example? Okay, so that's uh, large numbers of progeny, uh, mutation, quasi-species effects, and the last component of evolution is selection. So we'll talk about this. Now you've got the products for evolution, but you always have to select something because you don't just throw out uh, all the variants out there and, and expect them all to grow. An important point, and this may be counterintuitive, selection favors not only single mutations in a population that may be good for whatever the moment is, but it also favors diversity. How, so how can it favor diversity if it's selecting for individual mutations? Well, hopefully that'll, that'll be apparent to you, but the key is that you need a population that is diverse in order to provide the material for selection. When you restrict the diversity of a virus population, then the virus suffers. It doesn't do well under certain conditions, and we'll see an example of that in a moment. So it favors both selection and diversity. So when we talk about selection, uh, you all know this, of course, so survival of the fittest. The best mutation in a population is selected for. And, and again, this is for the moment. Evolution does not produce something that's going to be good in the future. Evolution produces something which is good at the moment in a cell and in, in an animal under particular conditions. That's going to work. And the next hour, the next day may be a totally different mutation. So we have survival of the fittest, a rare genome with a particular mutation may survive a selection event and eventually that propagates in all subsequent genomes. But we don't get rid of the variation. We have all the other changes as well and they get a free ride. So let's say you have a virus genome with a particularly really important mutation for selection at a given point in replication. That will be in all the progeny, but all the other mutations we call the selected, unselected mutations are going to go along because they're linked. They're on the same genome. So you get a new diverse population with only that selected uh, mutation, but you still maintain the diversity. And that diversity is important because in an hour or in 24 hours, in two weeks, you may have to use some of that diversity to overcome another selection event. It's very likely that in every cell, in every organism, there are selection forces at work that modify the population. So it's always important to maintain diversity. So you get selection and you get unselected mutations coming along. And so here's a nice example of the, the kinds of selection forces that are uh, ongoing in a virus infection, in a human infection. We talked a lot about AIDS, and you know that towards the end stage, the virus is replicating uh, very well. It's killing its, its cellular host, the CD4 positive T cells. And these virions that predominate at the end of AIDS are T cell tropic. That is, they engage the co-receptor CXCR4. Remember, the virus utilizes CD4 as a receptor, but also uses one of two co-receptors. CXCR4 or CCR5. When you pass the infection to a new host, by whatever route, by sex or by intravenous drug use, you pass on M-tropic genomes, not T-tropic genomes. And these are viruses that engage the CCR5 receptor. So you may inoculate someone with millions and millions of virus particles, but only the few that apparently recognize CCR5 will predominate. And what we say is that these genomes have passed through a bottleneck because you have many, many T-cell tropic viruses, but only the uh, M-tropic viruses go through. We're not sure why, but we think it has to do with the initial dendritic cells that are infected when you would transmit HIV. They may only have uh, CCR5 receptors on them. And so the virions that devastate your immune system, that cause immunosuppression, that cause AIDS, they're not the best ones for transmitting. The best ones for transmitting are a minority of that population, and so they can transmit the infection. And then when it takes hold in a new host, you rebuild those T-cell tropic populations from the M-cell tropic viruses by, again, selecting out the proper mutants, uh, and then they can go on and cause AIDS. So a nice example of a bottleneck of a selection, but you're also bringing along a population of virus with other changes that eventually will be selected uh, again.
<clears throat> so diversity is selected for. All right, I told you earlier that this is a property of polymerases that is selected for. Mutation is good for evolution, and it's good for virus populations. In fact, we know this because we, many people in the field, have attempted to make polymerases that make fewer mistakes. You can do this by engineering mutations uh, into them. This has been done in bacteria as well as in viruses. So you, in a virus, for example, a, a very well-known uh, mutant is a poliovirus mutant with a single amino acid change in the RNA polymerase. And this makes less errors. It makes fewer errors than the parental enzyme. And so that's weird. If you could, you could make a, a polymerase that makes fewer errors, why don't all polioviruses have it? So people have tried to uh, answer this question. And what you find is when you start studying these viruses with less error-prone polymerases, you can't make them without any, making any errors. Nobody's been able to do that. But they make significantly fewer errors. They don't have a selective advantage. If you uh, take this mutant and a wild-type virus and mix them and put them in cells or in an animal, the one virus that can't make a lot of mutations doesn't win ever. It's always the wild-type virus that wins in these competition experiments. So these lower rates are not advantageous in the lab, and apparently they're not selected for in nature, because the mutations that lead to this more faithful polymerase are certainly present in nature. They're not selected for. They're just being carried along. In animals, when you put these kinds of uh, anti-mutator enzymes, is, is one way to call them, they're less pathogenic. They simply cannot spread through the animal. So when you inoculate, say, a mouse with virus intraperitoneally, you know, it has to replicate in the gut. It's got to spread somehow and overcome lots of barriers like basal lateral membranes. It's got to go around the immune system, maybe spread in the blood. All those things requires diversity. And if you put an anti-mutator polymerase in the virus, it doesn't have the diversity to do that. So high mutation rates are a positive force. So you have to remember that I sometimes joke about error rates in viruses, but they're totally required for their existence. And like anything else, they wouldn't be there if they weren't uh, important. Okay, so that is uh, selection and error frequency. An important concept that I want to talk to you about for a few minutes is called the error threshold, okay? So I've just told you that you need to make a lot of mutations for a virus to survive to have an evolutionary advantage, okay? But there has to be a limit. You can't mutate until you don't look like the same virus anymore. There has to be a point at which selection and survival balance the fidelity of the polymerase and the mutation rate. And that's what the error threshold is. There has to be a some point of mutation, of making errors. You go above it, the virus is no longer infectious. And if you go too far below it, you don't have a selective advantage. So you have to be just at the right place. And what we have found by studying RNA and DNA viruses is that RNA viruses operate very close to their error threshold. They are living at the edge, where DNA viruses evolve far below their error threshold. And again, I contrast Rackin Yellow and Silverstein. You're skeptical. I'm trying to get you to argue, that's all. Okay, RNA viruses are right at the error threshold. They're living on the edge. DNA viruses are not. So what's the evidence for this? So here's an experiment using a base analog. Remember last time when we talked about antivirals, we talked about base analogs. You take one of the four bases and you modify it in some way so it messes up uh, DNA synthesis. So this one is 5 azacytidine. It's incorporated into growing change by the DNA polymerase. But it is, uh, it's incorporated, of course, as a C, azacytidine, but it templates as a G, as a T. When the polymerase sees it in the next round of replication, uh, instead of putting a G in, which it should for a C, it will put an A in. It looks like a T to the polymerase because of the chemical modification. So if you take this compound and you add it to cells infected with a DNA virus, uh, what you see is that you increase the mutation rate several orders of magnitude, 100, 1,000 fold. It's a lot. So adding this drug to a DNA virus infected cell really substantially increases the error rate. So this is the idea that these DNA viruses are existing way below their error threshold. 
if you do this experiment with an RNA virus, the error frequency only goes up two or three fold. So in other words, it's already at the error, or very close to the error threshold. Can't make any more mutations than it already is. And this makes sense, again, because again, these are highly error prone polymerases in these RNA viruses, so they can be there. And apparently being at the error threshold is good. You might imagine that it's not good because it doesn't take much to push you over it. But in fact, it must be because that's how these RNA viruses exist. Now, people are trying to take advantage of this as an antiviral approach. What if you made an antiviral that took an RNA virus and pushed it over this error threshold? That would inactivate it. You make too many mutations and the virus would no longer survive. And in fact, that's being tested for a variety of different uh, RNA viruses. So here's an example of that. It's an antiviral called vi ribavirin, which is in fact used uh, for a number of different virus infections, hepatitis C virus being one of them. And for many years, no one knew how this worked. They knew it was sort of a base analog and got incorporated into nucleic acid, but the precise mechanism wasn't clear. And then a series of experiments done about eight years ago showed that it's a mutagen that pushes the virus over the error threshold. Okay, so uh, here's an experiment where we're looking at the infectivity of the RNA. It's expressed as a percent. So if you start without any drug, uh, it's, you know, 100% infectivity. That's the set point. Now we're adding increasing amounts of the antiviral ribavirin. This is poliovirus in this study. And as you see here, as you add increasing amounts of ribavirin, the uh, infectivity rapidly drops. So here, uh, when you have, say, four mutations per genome. So instead of expressing the x-axis as concentration of drug, we're expressing it as mutations per genome. So you get a sense of how the drug is acting. So these are the extra mutations that are inserted into the genome when we add this drug to infected cells. Look at this. You put in four mutations, four additional mutations over what the virus normally would do, and you've lost over 80% over of the infectivity. So that's how this drug works. It makes the virus go over its error threshold. And uh, now the question is how these individuals who did this experiment selected viruses that are resistant to this drug. What do you think, where do you think the mutation that leads to resistance maps in what viral protein? <coughs> The resistance makes it not make the drug not push the virus over the error threshold. The RNA polymerase. The mutation makes the RNA polymerase less error prone. In fact, that's how the anti mutator was discovered by making viruses resistant to this drug. So you make fewer in mutations to begin with, and the drug can't push you over the error threshold. That's great. That viruses can over, always overcome something, but in the process, they tell us a lot uh, about error threshold. Okay, another concept I want to tell you about is genetic bottlenecks. We've already encountered one of these with HIV and the passage, the transmission of virus from one host to the other, how most of the viruses you make at end stage disease don't actually transmit. Here, here's some other examples. In the laboratory, if you take a virus and do a plaque assay, you get little plaques. You can pick each plaque with a pipette and then infect a fresh set of cells with it and plaque it again and then pick another plaque and so forth and keep doing this on and on and on. Okay, you do it over and over again. This is the experiment that's going to um, illustrate a genetic bottleneck. So what we're doing is we're taking a large population of viruses. We're putting them through a bottleneck so we have just a few progeny, and those are the progeny in the plaque. So the plaque doesn't have that many viruses compared to the whole population. Uh, and then we amplify that again, and then we restrict it through another bottleneck. So you do this many times. So you start with a single virus in the plaque. It gives out a few thousand progeny. You take those and replaque them again. Okay, so this is the bottleneck. You're going from a large population to a small one. A few thousand virions is a very artificial population because most virus stocks are much, much higher titer and therefore have much greater diversity. So after you do this about 20 to 30 times, you get viruses that can't grow. They barely are able to grow. They're less fit, 
and nothing has changed. You're just placking it from cell to cell. Same cells, the same temperature, same CO2, same environment. All you're doing it is going from cell to cell. Yet fitness has is, is gone down to nearly zero. So why is this? Well, the, the answer is, it lies in this thing called Muller's ratchet, uh, that small populations, in this case asexual, that's what viruses are, small asexual populations decline in fitness if the mutation rate is high. So we have two things happening here. We have a high mutation rate, which we know is typical of RNA viruses, but we've restricted the virus to a small population, an abnormally small population. All right, so we know that RNA viruses are existing at the error threshold. We're restricting the population to very, very s severe bottlenecks at each plaque assay. So we, c we don't have population diversity to rescue the virus. You have a rather fixed population, and mutations are accumulating in that population because of the error-prone polymerase. And as you pass the virus from plaque to plaque, more and more mutations accumulate, and eventually the virus is getting mutated beyond survival. And this happens again because you're not allowing for a full population, a full quasi-species to be present to rescue any deleterious mutations that might be present. So it's called the ratchet because of this little machine, which is a ratchet. Reminds me of Nurse Ratchet, remember her? No? Too, too old a movie? You remember Nurse Ratchet, right? Uh, one flew over the cuckoo nest. Um, it, each new mutation works like a ratchet, allowing the gear to move forward but not backward. So each round of error-prone replication works like this ratchet. Each mutation enters the genome and you, you can't get rid of it because there isn't a diverse population to rescue it. So that's why doing that kind of study is bad. So let's illustrate that here with our quasi-species diagram. Here is our initial population of viruses. And again, just a sampling of the population. Each genome is shown as a line, and the different mutations that distinguish them are shown here. So if you take this whole population and you submit it to some pressure, uh, maybe you'll get mutations selected for that improve replication in that condition, you know, a high temperature or low pH, whatever the condition you want. You do the whole population, you submit it to that, and the best viruses come out of it. But if you artificially restrict diversity by placking, so here we're, pla we're placking the virus. Uh, it's a little more diverse than shown here because you don't just pick one virus when you plaque. But um, uh, if you take, this is just for illustration, you take a plaque pick virus, you now have a very restricted new population, which all is very similar because of the picking of a single plaque. You could do the same thing by taking an infectious DNA clone of a virus. There you have one initiation event and putting it into cells, you have a very restricted population. And if you keep doing this, if you keep picking individual uh, viruses, you'll have the repeated bottlenecks, which we've just described. The mutations will continue to accumulate, as they always do, and you get decreased fitness. Again, because the mutations cannot be rescued by a diverse population, as it would be here. So that's this fitness bottleneck, and, and that's Muller's ratchet. And here's an example experimentally. You may not believe that this actually happens, so the best evidence is that someone has done it. Here are a number of different viruses which have been subjected to different numbers of bottleneck passages, that is plaque to plaque passages in the laboratory. And you can see the percent fitness decline uh, over time. And sometimes uh, when you don't have enough bottleneck passages, even with lower numbers of bottleneck passages, you have a large uh, decrease in fitness. So diversity is really important. A number of years ago, a student of mine was trying to plaque purify, I think, rhinovirus in the lab. And for some reason, she was going plaque to plaque. I think she wanted to adapt the virus to uh, a different host cell. And so she was doing plaque to plaque purification. And after 20 to 30 passages, she said, this virus can barely replicate. And I said, yeah, you have to go read the lecture on Muller's ratchet. That's what's going on there. So does this happen in the real world? For sure. Uh, there are often a number of situations where the inoculum is very small. So there's not a lot of population diversity and you could have ratchet effects such as the one we've been talking about. So you get, you acquire an infection by aerosol, you, you pick up a droplet or two, maybe there aren't many viruses in those droplets, enough to initiate infection, but they could cause a bottleneck. Uh, activation of latent viruses from a limited population of cells could have the same effect or when insects bite you, they put a small inoculum in. So all cases where 
there's a small number of virus particles, limited diversity, which could lead uh, to Muller's ratchet. So why do viruses work after all? If you know, influenza is always spreading by aerosol, why does it work? Uh, there are ways to rescue the dangers of Muller's ratchet. Now, uh, and what you need to do is somehow get a more diverse virus population. So if you're doing this in the laboratory, instead of picking a single plaque, you pick a couple and pool them and go from, cell, from uh, monolayer to monolayer that way. And that gives you more diversity. And diversity is the key. It allows you to rescue all the mutations that have accumulated in these viruses by passing them uh, from cell to cell. So that's what we can do in the laboratory. Um, and this, this um, can also be rescued in nature by recombination uh, and reassortment. And we'll talk about how that works uh, for influenza viruses specifically. So diversity is important. You cannot restrict it. If you remove it either by mutation, making an anti-mutator polymerase, which we talked about, or by restricting the numbers of progeny that infect the new host, uh, your population suffers. So really clear examples of how we need to have mutations in order for things to work. So here's an example of reconstructing a sick virus or two sick viruses to make something that is healthy. So we've accumulated lots of sick viruses during our Muller's ratchet experiment. And if we don't have enough diversity, we're never going to be able to recover that. But if we have enough population around with uh, mutations that don't span the entire genome, we can have recombination, for example, that uh, occurs between these two viruses. They're both sick because they have a mutation in different parts of their genome that inactivates it or reduces its efficiency, but recombination can give rise to a healthy viral recombinant where both mutations are removed. And you can only do this if you have a larger or more diverse population. If your population has low diversity, then all the, all the genomes are going to have too many mutations to rescue by this approach. So this is something that probably happens all the time in nature. When a virus is transmitted by an, an insect bite, um, recombination may initially occur to restore uh, the fitness that's needed. So exchange of genetic information among viruses is important uh, to maintain diversity. And as I said, it allows you to make genomes that work, that have suffered from the problems of Muller's ratchet. Uh, segmented RNA viruses do the same thing, but they reassort. They don't have to have the polymerase switching templates and making a recombinant molecule. Uh, they can undergo reassortment. And this is very important for influenza viruses and real viruses. And right now, with these new viruses that have emerged in China, this is a perfect illustration of how reassortment is used uh, to produce diversity. So let's talk a little bit about this in terms of selection. Um, when you are infected with viruses, of course, you make an antibody response and a cellular response. Uh, and ne by necessity, the virus needs to mutate to overcome those. So you always have viruses evolving in a host that are resistant to elimination by the antibodies or the cytotoxic T cells. And this happens in people with intact <coughs> immune systems. If the viruses couldn't do that, they wouldn't be able uh, to spread. And how does this happen? How do you make a virus that evades an antibody response? We talked about this briefly for HIV. In the course of an infection, the virus changes every few weeks to escape the antibody response. Influenza does the same thing on a yearly basis. And there are two kinds of change that account for this. There's what we call drift or shift, genetic drift or genetic shift. Genetic drift is the diversity that occurs when error-prone polymerases are replicating viral genomes. Each time the genome replicates, it makes errors. And some of those mutations may translate into the antigenic parts of the proteins that are recognized, say, by antibodies or cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So in influenza, as it replicates from year to year, it accumulates errors, and eventually over years, the strain will become resistant to the antibodies we produce or, or less neutralized, and then we have to change the vaccine to accommodate that. So that is genetic drift. It happens for HIV, for flu, for many other viruses. Genetic shift happens after recombination or reassortment. This is more rare because it requires a certain number of events, but there are lots of examples as well. So let's talk about influenza viruses in this sense, in sense of drift and shift. 
By now, you should be very familiar with these uh, influenza viruses, enveloped RNA viruses. They have a segmented RNA genome. This is very important for this discussion. It's in pieces. Again, it means that when you infect cells with two different viruses, all the pieces of RNAs mix up in the cell, and the progeny can have RNA segments from both parents. Right? Really important to remember that. We classify the influenza A viruses by the uh, antigenic composition of these two surface glycoproteins, the hemagglutinin uh, and the norminidase. And you will see, and in fact, if you've been looking at the news at all for the past couple of weeks, you've been seeing H7N9 influenza virus in China. So that's how we name these viruses, HX and NY. So, so far there are 17 HAs, different HAs defined by serology and sequence, and there are nine neuraminidases. Okay, so you can make different combinations of them. This, all 17 H's and N's can infect birds. Birds are a reservoir for every influenza virus. And that's one of the main places where new strains come from. In fact, this new strain uh, in China seems to have emerged from a number of uh, wild birds. So all of them can infect birds. Humans so far are only consistently infected by H1, H2, and H3 uh, hemagglutinins and N1 and N2 neuraminidases. That is viruses that transmit from human to human consistently and called, cause global epidemics only have these H's and, and the two N's that I told you. So H5N1 influenza, which you may have heard of, is an avian virus that occasionally infects people, but it doesn't transmit uh, from person to person for reasons we don't understand. We don't know why these are good at transmitting and the other ones are not. This is a big goal in, in research, and we'll come back to it towards the end of this course. Every X years, 10 to 30 or 40 years, a new, a brand new influenza virus strain emerges and it causes a pandemic, which is a global outbreak of uh, infection. Now, typically there are flu seasons every year, as you know, and these are caused, caused by what we call seasonal strains. But every so often there's a brand new strain that no one has ever seen. There's very little immunity globally and the virus spreads, causes a lot of sickness and death as well. And this is just a map of the last number of, of outbreaks that have occurred. Um, the, the, real, the one for which, uh, the oldest one for which we have sequences is the 1918 uh, influenza virus, which killed many, many hundreds of millions of people, many, many millions of people globally. Uh, we think this uh, virus originated in a duck, but we don't have a lot of sequence information from this era, so it's hard to pinpoint what went on. That virus stayed around until 1957. Every season it would cause influenza, not as severe as that first year. But in 1957, uh, a, new one, a new strain emerged, H2N2. So the 1918 strain is an H1N1. 1957, an H2N2 strain emerged. Nobody had immunity to H2N2, so the virus spread globally. So where did this H2 and N2 came from? Probably uh, from a duck virus. So somewhere, this uh, duck, a duck H2N2 reassorted with uh, the H1N1 that had been circulating. And you can see this virus has a number of segments from uh, this particular duck virus shown in yellow, including the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. Apparently it had the right mutations to spread in people. Again, we don't know what they are, but they just accumulated randomly, most likely in the duck. And then you had contact with the duck or some other animal in humans, and the virus takes off. And that virus stayed around until 1968. It was replaced by an H3N2. So the hemagglutinin was donated by a different duck virus. That's the blue segment right there. Uh, and that virus stayed around for a long time. And in fact, it's still circulating today, these H3N2 viruses. They have evolved quite a bit in the intervening years. They have undergone drift. So they are quite different from the original, but they're still around. Uh, in 19, um, 2009, then, a new strain showed up, which wasn't here as well. There was a new H1N1 emerged in 1977, which looked identical to viruses that were around in 1950. And we think this was from a laboratory accident uh, where someone pulled this virus out of the freezer and was doing human trials with it, and it got out. But nobody will live up to that. So proof is, is forthcoming. But this virus now uh, is circulating as well. In 2009, we had a new pandemic strain emerge that's shown here, 2009 H1N1. And this was a reassortant among a number of different animal 
uh, influenza viruses, a variety of uh, swine viruses. You can see Eurasian and classic swine. In 1918, when we had this big outbreak of influenza, those viruses went into pigs at the same time, and they have been evolving in pigs ever since. That's what classic swine H1N1 is. Uh, and then other pigs have been infected with other viruses over time. And so this human flu virus was a reassortment of various swine viruses, a human H3N2, an avian virus, which went, underwent an initial reassortment event and then gave rise to this. So you can see the RNA segments from this 2009 virus comes from many different uh, animal and human viruses. So this is reassortment. This is what reassortment can do, having multiple animal uh, reservoirs for the virus. And this is why we worry about influenza virus, because periodically a brand new virus is going to emerge to which we don't have uh, any immunity. So the, the H7N9 virus that's just emerged in China is totally new to humans. It, it reassorted just like this in a variety of uh, bird hosts. But so far it hasn't transmitted from human to human. It's not clear that it'll, it'll ever acquire that uh, ability. We'll talk more about that later on. So that's antigenic shift, reassortment to make new viruses. Uh, antigenic drift is more subtle. This happens every year. There are a few amino acid changes in the hemagglutinin protein, which is shown here of influenza virus. These happen at the very tip of the HA molecule. These are where antibodies would normally bind uh, to block infectivity, but here uh, these, these areas change and then you're no longer neutralized by the antibodies. So that's why you have to change uh, the vaccine. One more example of recombination and how it can give rise to new viruses. So far I've talked about recombination and reassortment among viruses of the same kind. But this is an example of how a virus can pick up a sequence from the host cell and become more virulent. So these are uh, bovine diarrhea viruses. Uh, these are obviously pathogens of cows. Uh, there is a, a virus that circulates among cows that infects them very well but doesn't cause disease. Uh, and that's shown up here, non-cytopathic bovine viral diarrhea virus. Uh, in replicating in cows, this virus picked up uh, cellular sequences, shown here in brown. Uh, two different types of viruses that have been produced. These viruses are quite lethal in cows, and they're cytopathic in cell culture. Uh, this sequence comes from the host cell. It actually encodes a cleavage site for a cellular protease that happens to be ubiquitous. It's present in many tissues of the cow. So probably it was picked up randomly uh, in an isolated cow somewhere, but it, it is apparently more transmissible and, and the virulence helps it get from cow to, house, so cow to cow, so this has been selected for. So an example of how recombination can make a virus that can overcome blocks as well, and the sequence comes from the host cell. So this actually brings up the question of whether virulence is something that is selected for or not because you're all familiar with viruses that are, are or are not virulence, is this a good thing or a bad thing? The idea is that increased virulence uh, may reduce transmissibility because if you die quickly, if you die in a day or so from a virus infection, you're not likely to transmit it. Uh, and if this were true, then all viruses should evolve to be maximally infectious and not virulent. But that's not the case, of course. We have plenty of virulent viruses out there. We have persistent infections that go on for ages and eventually kill the host. Uh, we have lots of viruses which are virulent in one species and not in the next, so there's no general principle that we can really figure out. What we do understand, though, is for some diseases, increased virulence may actually help transmission. So don't think of virulence as just killing the host. Think of virulence as, say, making you cough harder or expel more droplets full of virus. If that's the case, then increasing virulence will make the virus uh, more transmissible. So here is an example where a virus was attempted to be used to control an animal population and this virulence issue uh, reared its head. So uh, this is an experiment done in Australia where in the late 1800s they brought rabbits from Europe because they wanted to hunt them and so they figured they'd let the rabbits come and multiply and they'd go out and shoot them. But in a very short period of time, these rabbits overran the country, lots of them as you can see here. And so then they decided down in Australia they have to get rid of them because there are too many of them, they're going to overrun the country. So what they did was get this virus, this myxoma virus, a pox virus called Lepura pox. Uh, they released it to get rid of the rabbits. 
Uh, the virus in its natural host doesn't do anything serious. Uh, but in European rabbits, which are the ones that were introduced in, into Australia for hunting, it's 90 to 99% fatal. So the idea was they released an infected rabbit into Australia. The virus is spread by mosquitoes from rabbit to rabbit, and they thought this would get rid of uh, infection. So in the first year, that, that, was, that worked. The mortality rate was almost 100%. But then the second year, it dropped to 25%. Uh, and then finally, it never worked because the reproductive rate of the rabbits uh, was higher than the lethality uh, of the virus. I think now it's about 50%, which is not avirulent by any means. But it's not enough to get rid of the rabbit population. So what happened here? That's a nice experiment in virus revolution. The rabbits and viruses all, all produce a lot of offspring. Uh, the virus evolved to kill fewer rabbits and to extend their life so it could be picked up by mosquitoes and transmitted uh, to another rabbit. In particular, the virus uh, can overwinter and spread in the spring, so they let the rabbits live longer. The rabbits evolved. The survivors were more resistant to virus killing, uh, and those genes persisted in the rabbit population. So this is a typical example of how a new virus uh, in a new host is evolving and comes to some kind of balance with its host. So the lesson you always get what you select, but you don't always get what you want. This was a bad idea because there were selective forces at work that nobody really understood. They just thought, ah, the virus kills 100% of rabbits, this will work, but they didn't realize that both the virus and the rabbit would evolve. Now, in Australia, apparently, they didn't learn a lesson. They're undergoing, they're, they're doing more uh, experiments to use a different virus, a Khaleesi virus, to uh, control rabbits still. So. They have a rabbit problem in Australia. So an example of how a host and a virus evolves to benefit uh, both. Uh, where did viruses come from? You may be interested to know. I talked to you at the beginning of the course uh, about where they were. We knew they were very old. There are a couple of theories about uh, where viruses came from. Uh, some people think they are derived from parasites that lived in cells and lost genes. Some people think they uh, arose from cells and then they lost genes. And other people think that they co-evolved from cells and, event and stole genes along the way, pickpocket. I like the name for this theory, the pickpocket theory. The problem is there aren't any fossils. We know that there are now sequences of viruses in genomes and that helps us a lot. But it's not like you can go out and pick up a piece of uh, rock and get viruses from it. So you have to do some other things and bioinformatics has helped us a lot here. So here's just one theory on how viruses erose. You remember at the beginning of life there was an RNA world. We think that the cellular life present all was based on RNA. They didn't have DNA genomes. So here we have uh, some different lineages of RNA based cells and the little circles in them are meant to represent that they have different ways to make proteins. So we think that in this RNA world there wasn't one way to make proteins. Uh, we do think that there was a lineage that evolved to have ribosomes, which are probably RNA-based machines. And so maybe that one persisted. It eliminated all the others via competition. And now you have um, a DNA-based world, and these DNA-based organisms have ribosomes that make their proteins. And maybe some of these lineages persisted as parasites, intracellular parasites. So you see this brown guy here is persisting as an intracellular parasite, can only grow inside of the host cell. Uh, and then maybe eventually uh, these evolved to become viruses. So these parasites uh, lost uh, most of their genes and became viruses of these host cells. So this is one idea for the origin of viruses from uh, this original RNA world. But can we be more specific than that? We have very little evidence for that it's because, as I said, that's quite old and we don't have any sequences to prove it. These very large DNA viruses provide lots of food for thought. There are a number of families of DNA-containing viruses. They're huge. You can see this one is uh, not the biggest one, but it dwarfs rhinoviruses. They have very large DNA genomes. And these, these viruses from different families are not mixtures of each other. Um, they, within each family, the genes are very similar. Uh, between the families, they're quite different. So it's hard to ju justify or provide evidence that these arose by acquiring genes from cells because they would have more homology across the different virus families. So we think that this provides evidence that 
viruses arose from cells, as I showed you in the previous slide, and then slowly lost their genes. And these viruses with very big DNA genomes are somewhat earlier in that loss cycle. So they haven't lost all of their genes yet. A lot of these viruses have tRNA uh, genes, for example. So the DNA viruses, as I told you, are at least as old as the dinosaurs. We can do uh, genome evolution calculations and show that they were certainly with the dinosaurs uh, 180 uh, to 220 million years ago. But that's not very long ago uh, in the time scale of Earth's formation, of course, four and a half billion years ago. So a lot of information here is, is clearly missing. But we can fill in some of the later steps and figure out where viruses came from, more contemporary. And in terms of human viruses, it's pretty, I think it's likely that all, um, well, first of all, all the known types of viruses evolved a long time ago. Well, let's go back here. I don't know how old it was, but maybe the last universal cellular ancestor somewhere in here. All the viruses were probably evolved by then. What I mean by that is all seven genome types and the different structural types. So that means that that happened a long time before humans appeared on Earth, which is relatively recently in the time scale. And so it means that all the viruses we have today probably came from animals, which were here a long time before us on the Earth. So we can actually pinpoint some of these crossovers from animals to humans, but my, I always assume that they all came uh, from animals at some point or another. Uh, here are a couple of examples. Smallpox virus. You can do sequence analysis of different isolates uh, of the virus. Uh, and um, these help you understand how these viruses, what sequences they have in common, what their common ancestors are. And that sequence analysis tells you that they probably went into humans pretty recently. And in fact, there is a gerbil pox virus, a specific one that has pretty good homology, homology to smallpox. And the idea is that maybe a zoonotic infection from gerbils to human at one point many years ago uh, started the smallpox epidemic. So this is what I mean by all human viruses emerging from animals. The gerbils were around long before humans. They had acquired viruses from other uh, sources. Then they passed it on to us. So here's one idea that the gerbil smallpox gave rise to uh, human smallpox. Measles virus uh, is very closely related to a virus that infects cows. And we think uh, it came from an old rinderpest viruses of cows that jumped into people when we started to domesticate these animals. So we didn't always have cows on farms, of course. There was a period before that. But as soon as we gathered them on farms, then we became susceptible to being infected by their viruses. Uh, and so we think that um, measles transferred to humans from cows about 5,000 years ago when populations began to congregate and would have uh, contact with large numbers of these animals. Uh, and we think this happened in the Middle East initially, from the cow to the human, and then it spread around the world. The, the early colonialists took measles with them and spread it to the rest of the world where it had been absent. So it destroyed Native Americans who didn't put cows together like they did in the Middle East. Uh, and that's how the virus is all over. Nevertheless, so we've talked a lot, a lot about evolution and mutation in this course. Nevertheless, there is a limit. It's not just an error threshold, but there's a limit to how much a virus can change. Influenza virus can evolve a lot, but it's always going to be an influenza virus. It's not going to change its genome. So why is that? What constrains viral evolution? Because that has to operate within whatever the virus is, a herpes virus or an influenza virus uh, or a polio virus. The virus's properties, the structure in its genome, that really constrains evolution. So the virus cannot go beyond uh, what it already is. Uh, so extreme alterations don't survive selection. You cannot change the genome so it no longer looks like an influenza virus. You can't change the nature of the genome. You can't change from RNA to DNA or vice versa. At least we've never seen this happen. The replication strategy. Uh, the coronaviruses get into a cell and they induce membranes and they replicate their genome on the surface of the membrane. That requires interaction with specific cellular proteins. And you cannot mutate that genome so it no longer recognizes those proteins. It will not function any longer. So it's an example of the constraints that the virus has to mutate within. Uh, the physical nature of the capsid, uh, 
Icosahedral capsids can only take so much genome, so the genome can't get bigger. Uh, and selection during infection of a host. Uh, if a virus evolves that bypasses all host defenses, the host will be gone. So these are the kinds of constraints that we think limit evolution so that once an influenza virus is present from who, who knows how many uh, years ago, it remains an influenza virus and doesn't change into anything else. So years ago, viruses evolved possibly from cells, maybe by some other mechanism. They began to infect the early uh, life forms on the earth, and then when humans arise, those viruses jumped into humans uh, as well. But what about the future? What are new viruses going to look like? And we make the assumption that all new viruses that evolve are basically going to be variants of what's already here. We're not going to make any brand new viruses as far as, as far as we think. There's really no more space to uh, enter in. There are no more new kinds of viruses to make. So the really interesting question is, what is the number of all possible mutations of a genome? If you could look at this, then maybe you could get a sense for where viruses are going. In fact, that number is so big that it will never, never be tested uh, in nature. Now, every, in some RNA virus genomes, uh, over half of all the nucleotides in the genome can ac accommodate mutations. So for a 10KB genome, there are more than four to the 5,000 sequence permutations that define all possible mutants. So assuming that every base can be changed, but maybe it's only half of this, but still it's a pretty big number. So that's just mutation. There are four to the 5,000 sequence permutations of all possible new mutations of any given virus. Uh, if you add deletions, recombination, and reassortment, uh, the number gets larger as well. So this number is based on the 10KB viral genome, 50% of the 10KB viral genome. This is a huge number. This is the number of atoms in the visible universe, 4 to the 135. 4 to the 5,000 are all the possible sequence permutations of a virus with a 10KB RNA genome, and that's just one. That's just incredible. It just goes to show you how, how much variation uh, can occur. So viruses are always mutating. And essentially, from that number, you can see that the possibilities are really unimaginable. We can't even begin to fathom. We have no way, computational way, of beginning to predict what all these different changes might do. All we can say is that future viruses are derived from the ones uh, that are here today. And there just can be many, many of them. And remember, we only know about 1% of the viruses today that even exist on the globe. So, you know, studying the others is really important, although it's hard to uh, get the support to do that. So prediction is really useless on this grand scale. To see where viruses are going is, is just impossible because the numbers are so big and we don't have uh, a way of doing it. So I'm sorry to leave you with that uh, note, but in fact, we can't really predict where things are going. And that's why we can't predict the next pandemic influenza virus. We can only react when it comes about. We're not at the point of doing that, and I'm not sure we ever will be able to. And let me leave you with some food for thought. As you know, we are all 98 or 99 percent chimp. Our genome is that similar to the chimpanzee genome. It took 8 million years for simian primates to become human, it changed 2 percent of their genome to become human, 8 million years. Now in the time that polio goes from the mouth to the gut, it changes 2 percent of its genome. That takes about 5 days. So 2%, 8 million years, 2%, 5 days. You tell me who is cooler uh, than this virus. So imagine what a virus can do with 8 million years. Pretty neat.